Chudan so ki chunam la jan chu patu dane kapsu chi Tanki din so ki pe so nam ki Drola penche sange ju pa sho Sange chudan so ki chunam la jan chu patu dane kapsu chi Tanki din so ki pe so nam ki Drola penche sange ju pa sho Sangye chudon so ki chunam la Chan chu ba du da ni kyap su chi Da ki jin so ki pe so nam ki Dro la pen chi sangye ju pa sho All right, so um, it's a, an hour session, but you're not going to be absolutely fixed in place for an hour. Don't worry, you'll get a little stretch break in the middle. Uh, we'll do the first ho half hour the way those of you that have been coming each week are used to with a bit of a single pointed meditation, a bit gentle mindfulness. And the way that goes is basically first a bit of body relaxation because uh, whether we're aware of it or not, we kind of gather tension in our body just from the stress of the morning. Then we're going to um, reconnect with our motivation or set our intention. Why is it we're meditating? Because some of the um, hardest part to meditating is when you get bored or when you get distracted, what will bring you back? Asking yourself, what will bring you back to the meditation and not just drift on this interesting tangent that your mind has come up with or to try and figure out the second verse of that song in your head, right? What will bring you back is your intention. Yeah, um, if you don't know why you're meditating, then there's no point to come back to it, is it? It's like, well, that's boring, right? So we set our intention, and then we shift our focus to the breath. And when you're watching the breath, you're not changing it, right? Sometimes you'll have a shallow breath, sometimes you'll have a deep breath. You're not doing anything about it, you're just being with it as your focal object. And the benefit of using the breath is that the breath lives in the body, the body lives in the present because it's physical. It has no choice but to be in the present. So if you bring your mind to something like that, you naturally become present and focused there. It could be that a few people um, get triggered into some anxiety by focusing on the breath. If that's you, just shift to another physical experience that's not triggering, like the way your feet feel in your socks. Yeah, or um, the way your hands feel in your lap. Another very obvious physical sensation, but something that's a little bit easier for you to be with. So we'll focus on the breath for a little bit, and it's a very good way to help the mind not be distracted and settle down from its craziness. And then we'll shift into a clarity of mind meditation. So the first half of this session will be um, quite easygoing, and then the second half of the session we'll do something more analytical to dig into... Um, how we hurt ourselves and others <laughs> through our thinking, okay? Just really gently. Um, and again, um, no one has to be Buddhist to do Buddhist meditation, and if there are points that you don't connect with, you just leave them aside, yeah? Okay, so we'll just start by getting yourself a good posture, <coughs> nice straight back, get all the squeaks out of the chair. And just check that you're sitting in a way that you can be straight up and down without relying on the back of the chair. And you can have your hands just comfortably in your lap or on your knees, or in the traditional way, the left on the bottom, the right on top, the two thumbs touching, whichever you prefer. And so with the sound of the bell, bring your attention to your physical experience. And bring your attention to the crown of your head. and relax all of the muscles around the scalp and the ears as if someone had poured water over you that was exactly the right temperature.
the brow unfurrowing, the jaw unclenched. All of the muscles around the face and mouth completely softened. Allow the eyes to rest gently closed or else just slightly open, gazing unfocused at the floor in front of you. And bring your awareness to your neck and the tops of your shoulders, imagining everything settling into its natural position. The shoulders dropping down into their natural position. Move your relaxation down the left arm, all the way through the joints and ligaments and muscles, imagining any tension leaving out the left fingertips dissolving into space. And shift your focus over to your right arm, relaxing down through the muscles and joints, ligaments and tendons, any tension leaving out your right fingertips, dissolving into space. and bring your focus back to your neck. And now work your way down your spine, vertebrae by vertebrae, all the surrounding muscles of the back, gradually working your way down to your seat, imagining everything coming into alignment, any pockets of tension dissolving. Just gently move your focus down the back.
bringing the relaxation all the way down to your seat. Feeling very solid and grounded and connected to your seat. Stable. And then move your focus forward into the torso and the internal organs. And just imagine that all of those organs and all of the muscles again settle into their natural possession. No clenching or tightening. The stomach fully relaxed, nothing held in. And bring that relaxation down through your hips and down the left leg, all the way through the muscles and joints. Imagining tension leaving out the left toes, dissolving into space. and down through the right leg, relaxing all of the muscles through all of the joints. Any remaining tension leaving out the right toes, dissolving into space. And now ask yourself, why am I meditating? What's my main reason for doing this meditation? <coughs> and it could be curiosity, or to relax. It could be to focus or to develop on the spiritual path. But whatever your motivation is for meditating, just gently expand it with the idea that whatever peace I touch internally, may it radiate outward, benefiting all those around me, my friends and family, the people in this town, the ripple effect going all the way outward. So I do this meditation not just for myself, but to be of some benefit to all living beings. And just frame that in your own words to yourself, letting it sink in.
And so with that motivation, now shift your focus to your breath. Just letting your attention follow the breath in and out. Focused, without tension. Relaxed, without sleep. Just be with the breath. And with each breath, you have a choice whether to wake up or go back to sleep, whether to connect with peace or continue with agitation. And so if with one breath you make the wrong choice, just make the right choice the next breath. And if you fall into a train of thought, just gently disengage and come back to the breath. Not pushing away the thoughts, but also not falling into them and following them. Just lift out of them and come back to the breath.
Notice if you've started to drift or sink. And if so, rebalance yourself on the breath. And now gradually let go of your focus on the breath and try to be with the clarity of the mind itself. The thoughts will continue to come and go. Different sensations and distractions might still occur. But try to be with that part of your consciousness that is reflective without commentary. Spacious and clear. Just rest your attention there. As if that awareness were the sky and all the different thoughts and emotions clouds. Try not to get distracted by or identify with the mental weather. Just go to the sky, spacious and clear.
and then consciously re-engage your conceptual mind by thinking, may any peace I have found, any clarity, may this go towards developing my fullest potential in order to be of greatest benefit to all living beings. May this inner peace ripple outward as outer peace. So relaxing your attention, and if you need to stretch or change position, we'll just have a little mini break. Okay, so, um, when you have a very intriguing thought, it's hard to let it go. Um, but just sort of, you know, if a mental image helps, you could picture it like um, a child letting go of a balloon floating into space, but without the grief of the child having lost their balloon or the danger to birds, right? But <laughs> that sort of imagery, right, of the balloon flying up, you know, you're holding on to this thought so tightly, it's so important. But if you just kind of release, it drifts up, and in a few minutes, you forgot why it was so important. Um, and if it really is important, you can come back to it, right? It's not like you're doing thought neglect. Like, oh, that was an important thought I didn't give energy to. Well, if it's that important, you'll think about it again. Yeah, but most of our thoughts just, they really are like weather, just coming and going. They seem really dramatic at the time and then they're gone. Um, or they seem really boring at the time um, and we want them to kind of get entertaining. And so we, you know, try and sprinkle something into them to get them more entertaining. Um, this would be more fun with a soundtrack, this would be more fun with a cat in my lap, this would be more fun with snacks, this would be more fun with whatever your thing is, but um, if you can kind of let the mind stop elaborating, you will be able to come closer and closer to that clarity and that reflective aspect of the mind where a lot of um, creativity is born from, where a lot of happiness and satisfaction is born from, but it's hard to touch it unless you let the mind kind of chill out with all the surface chatter. So um, now we're gonna do a little analytical meditation, just really gentle analysis. And it's, um, it's like having a conscious conversation in your mind, um, as if you were talking to another person, but you're talking to yourself about ways of thinking that don't work. Because if you really come to an aha moment in your meditation, it's much more likely that you'll catch yourself in the mistaken thinking in your daily life. So the one we're gonna do is looking at permanence and impermanence. And it's really simple. Um, the idea of impermanence is something we talk about in Buddhism a lot, but it's not a religious concept. It's just the fact that things change, right? Just the fact that things change. And the fact that things change is not good news and it's not bad news, right? It's not good news or bad news, it's just what is. But when we hold on to things that change and want them to not change or assume they won't change, then we suffer, right? So, you know, an example would be if you have a really bad headache and you think this will never change, you might not consciously be thinking this will never change, but it sort of feels like that's my day now, you know, when you have a really big physical ouch. Um, and that actually increases your tension and your agitation about the pain and makes it more likely to last longer, makes you more unhappy with it, right? But if you knew that it would last exactly an hour and a half, right, you'd be like, oh, well, I can cope with an hour and a half, right? It, it the way that you view it is really different. Um, if something beautiful was happening, if you were having an amazing conversation with your closest friend and you're getting all along really well and you're making each other laugh and you're going over old times and the weather is perfect and the coffee shop <clears throat> ambiance is perfect and the food is perfect, everything is perfect, if you're assuming this won't change or you're wanting it to last, then you will suffocate it, right? If you think this moment in time I want to last forever, you almost ruin it in that very moment. But if you go, this is, a, this is just a, a moment in time, it's gonna be gone soon, then you can kind of go into it fully and are fully present with it and get the most out of it. 
though the problem is not impermanence. The problem is that we assume things will last, and that makes us suffer both when things are good and when things are bad. So this is so basic, right? This is not rocket science. It's just common sense. But the problem is, is we have an innate grasping at permanence or a fundamental assumption that stability is possible, right? You could spend a whole life trying to get stability, financial stability, relationship stability, health stability. Will that stop death, <laughs> right? Will it stop the economy crashing if it's going to crash anyway? Will it stop the bushfires? You know, so living with um, the assumption that stability is possible if you just got really, really organized means that your, your day is full of a lot of unnecessary tasks and stress. Possibly. Yeah, possibly. So we're just going to play with this analytically. And if there are points that you don't agree with, you just let them go. But if there are some points that hit home, speak them back to yourself in the way that you talk to yourself anyway. Let them sink in and land so that you have more happiness in your life, so that you cut people some slack, so that you're kinder. Um, you know, let it touch you a little bit, because that's the point of analytical meditation, is for a conceptual thought to kind of hit you in the heart and actually become your way of being. Um, so we'll just get it, give it a try, um, come back to a good, a good posture, and just thinking about the last meditation, was there anything about your posture that you would have tweaked, but you were scared to because the chair was going to squeak? Do the squeaking again now. Yeah, and if you need a cushion under your feet or um, to take off a layer or add a layer, go ahead and do that. And we'll start again with the breath, but just for a minute to let the surface distractions settle again. So with the sound of the bell, shifting your focus back to the breath. and revive your motivation. I'm meditating in order to develop my mind so that I can be of benefit to all living beings. Again, framing that into words that resonate for you. And so on the surface, it feels like lots of things stay the same. Like even your own self, that the person you were on the playground as a child is somehow the same person sitting here with more habits added to it. With an aging body, more experience, but otherwise the same. It sort of feels like that on the surface. But try and connect with impermanence by thinking simply of yesterday at this same time. Bring your mind back to yesterday at around this time. What were you doing? How were you feeling?
and compare it to what you're doing now, today in this moment. What is the same? What is different? Are you an identical person to yesterday at this same time? There's a thread of continuity linking the you of yesterday to the you of today. But they're not exactly the same person. There's ways you would respond. There's ways you would act different than yesterday. What's going on with your body, your energy level? What's going on with your mind, the different thoughts? What's going on with your mood? All of it changing moment to moment. Is that true or not true? Just examine your experience. And so despite the fact that change is obvious, do you ever agree to things or say yes to things based on holding yourself at your best, what you'd be able to do on a really good day, then you agree? Or do you ever say no to things based on how you feel at your worst, thinking that's who I am? So just think for a minute if you ever make plans on the basis of a solid sense of self, an unchanging identity, you at your best or you at your worst, holding that as me and making plans. And so think about what happens to you when you make plans based on how you are at your best. Say, yes, I can do that. I can help with that. I'll be there at that time. I'll join you in that. But because you're impermanent and changing every moment, sometimes you're at your best and sometimes you're not. And then you're not able to maintain that plan or that agreement. And then feel disappointed in yourself. Angry that you overcommitted. Annoyed at others for asking. All sorts of things happen. So just sift through your memories and see if you've ever done that made a plan doomed to failure, assuming the self was permanent.
And have you ever said no to things that you then regretted? Because in that moment of deciding you weren't feeling well, either mentally or physically, maybe you'd overbooked yourself in the past, didn't want to do that again. But then because you're changing every moment, you started to feel better. And then we're sad that you missed out. And do you ever do this to other people? Hold a snapshot of them in your mind, of them at their best version, their kindest, their funniest version, their most helpful. And then if you see them in another version, you're so disappointed, like they broke an agreement with you as if anyone were ever at their best all the time. Have you ever done this with people you don't like? Held a snapshot of them in their mind at their most angry or their most needy, when they've been manipulative, <coughs> when they've been dark, deciding that's who they are. And despite the fact that people aren't at their worst all the time, you hold this idea so much so that just seeing this person, you're annoyed, even if that particular day they were fine. That day they might have been balanced and clear. But because of holding this fixed sense of them in your mind, you suffered. So you're just checking to see, do I hang on to a fixed view, an unchanging view of myself and others? And when I do, what is the disadvantage? Both in how I see myself and how I see others. And now shift to thinking of the benefit of when you have remembered impermanence, the fact that things change. When you've been with the flow. Try and think of a day when you were just moving with your energy, mental and physical, pacing your day in a way that accord with 
your actual state of mind and state of health. When there was some effort, but not pressure. Thinking of any months or years when you've planned your life well. When you've anticipated the different ebbs and flows, the different waves of energy, mood, and so weren't burnt out at the end. And also didn't feel useless at the end. Did you ever have days, weeks, months like that? There was enough scheduled, there was enough unscheduled. There was enough intention, but also enough flexibility. And thinking again how you are with others when you're remembering impermanence, the way that they change. When they're in an aspect that you enjoy, you just enjoy them. When they're in an aspect you don't enjoy, you know it will pass. And so just make a conclusion to yourself that remembering the fact of change <coughs> keeps you open, keeps you flexible. And when you start to make your views too concrete, then you become locked in your conceptions. You become tense. things become a hassle. And so dedicate by thinking, may I remember impermanence in order to make the best use of my life, in order to be of greatest benefit to all.
can uh, relax here. <coughs> Do you have any um, questions or um, interesting ideas or objections that came up during that meditation? Probably yeah. the most relaxing meditation I've had in a long time. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. I feel like sometimes analytical meditation is reminding you of your sanity and reminding you of your wisdom, and then you click back into it. It's almost, it's almost like not new knowledge. It's kind of revisiting that place in yourself that already knows. Yeah, and it, then when you remind yourself of what you already know, it becomes like forefront in the day. Um, yeah, it can be really useful. Did anyone have a struggle? Mm -hmm. Yep, how'd you go with your struggle? No, I struggle. What's the main struggle, do you reckon? Thoughts. Yep. yep. They feel intrusive or intriguing? Well, I think they're both. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so it, it's just hard to kind of like track the pace of the meditation because other thoughts are coming in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, can, it can be useful. I think it was... Um, Venerable Rabina uses this analogy sometimes where if you can imagine meditating a bit like if you were in a very busy cafe by yourself reading the newspaper. You, you were really into the newspaper, but it's not like you were unaware of the busyness of the cafe, right? Imagine you're by yourself in the cafe reading the newspaper or your tablet. I don't know what we do now. What do we do? But um, you're reading and you're in it and you're focused on the content of what you're reading. But as different people come and go in the cafe, you don't get up and say hi to every single one of them. You're just kind of vaguely aware of them. So in meditation, it's like the newspaper is your focal object. And the people coming and going are like the other thoughts and emotions and distractions. And you, you know, you can be aware of them, but you're not going to jump up and, and greet each one and ask them to tell them about themselves, right? Um, so we can do this kind of focusing. We do do it already. We're just not used to doing it in meditation. It's that same quality you can do in that situation where you are quite focused on something while half aware of the other things. The problem for us is that when we have a, a thought, we're so used to kind of latching on to it and embellishing it that to consciously direct our thoughts with other thoughts is just the new skill. You can direct your thoughts to other things like a television or a book or, you know, nature or something. That we can do. But to tell your thoughts to look at other thoughts, it's just a new skill. But it's the same kind of like basic ability you already do in other contexts. So if you feel like the thoughts are not the problem, the, you know, whether they're intriguing or invasive, they're not the problem. The problem is getting up and talking to each one. You know what I mean? And so you just yeah. be like, yep, I see you. Anyway, we can catch up later if you're important. <laughs> right? You know, I really do need to get milk after this. Okay, okay. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you're certainly not alone. You're certainly not alone. Yeah. What it does for me is it's sort of funny peaks. I use the analogy a lot of the warm and the wet sort of something. Mm. And that I, I'm pretty sure I think this and I feel this about a certain issue. But the slowing down sufficiently allows me actually to see a different perspective. And mm. I actually question what I think and feel about something. Absolutely. And it just gives you that comfy space to just turn a few degrees test it out. Absolutely. And then you find yourself perhaps permanently or into maybe even just 15 degrees from where you were, but it's a really important change of perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely like that. There's what we think and then there's what we think we think. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it's like you, you think you know better and yet you behave <coughs> as if you don't know better. So obviously, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, it's the very deepest kind of listening, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, Listening with a, just a gentle adjusting, mm -hmm. a gentle, gentle adjusting, not forcing it. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, and you keep it kind of experimental and light and don't put too much pressure on yourself, you know, and just kind of, let's see what happens if I throw this topic into the mind's analytical mm -hmm. ability and see how it swims around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just kind of play with it and not expect yourself to have giant insights especially if you've had really good meditations in the past and you're wanting to repeat them all the time, you can kind of set yourself up for, um, you know, disappointment. Um, and uh, to know that the, quote, boring meditations are as useful as the 
light bulb meditation because part of it is building the habit to sink into the process and to be able to meet yourself however you are any given day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, any, any questions about that or um, <laughs> Buddhism in general or anything miscellaneous before we call it a day? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then, all right, it's lovely to see you guys, and I think we're having a little class after this. Um, I don't know what time it starts, do you? In half an hour? Okay, so break for half an hour, and then if you're still around, we'll have a bit of a Dharma chat. So have a nice rest of your day. <laughs>